introduction. Uh, first of all, congratulations to all of you guys that are here. That is phenomenal uh, what you guys are doing. I got to sit in on a few of the lightning round sessions. I was just really blown away at not only the mission, but the passion that you guys all have. Uh, so I'm excited to be here today and talk to you guys uh, about my experience with college on Tall and Junk and what I've learned, and really what I wish I had known when I was sitting in the seats that you guys are now, thinking about getting ready to launch my business. Uh, real quick show of hands, who here has been to a high school football game? It's about everybody here, I would imagine. Uh, the story I want to start with telling you guys about is my senior year of high school, I actually decided not to play football uh, because I didn't want to get hurt uh, for basketball season. I had just these visions and goals of becoming a, uh, uh, a college basketball star at some point, so I didn't want to get injured uh, before my senior year of basketball, but I did have some friends on the basketball team that I wanted to go out there and support and, uh, and really cheer on in their final season. So we went out to uh, uh, watch our team play one of the biggest cross-town rivals that we had, the Bullets Bulldogs. And unfortunately for us, our team hadn't won a game all season. We were winless basically defeated. And the Bullets Bulldogs were undefeated that season. They hadn't lost the game. They were in the top 10 in the entire city. So we were really not going out there expecting to see much of the game. We were just really going out there to show our support for our friends who were playing on the team. I know you guys all understand what this is like being from Texas. So um, went out there, and right from the kickoff, it was like there was something special in the air. I mean, our team was intercepting the ball. We were sacking the quarterback. We were catching touchdowns. And we were winning the game. And so it started to occur to us, all of a sudden we started having this realization, we're going to pull off this momentous upset for our senior year. And at the time, all of a sudden this vision popped into my head, a vision I had never experienced before, but I had seen many times on television, uh, when you hear about the whole Friday Night Lights uh, type of uh, uh, celebration, when there's a team that pulls off the big upset, the fans of the team that just won the game, they run onto the field and they jump up and down and they celebrate. They, you know, knock the goalposts over or they cut down the nets if it's a basketball game. Well, obviously, I hadn't had that opportunity this year or in my high school experience because my team hadn't won yet. And uh, so the vision popped into my head and I started thinking to myself, wow, when we win this game, I'm going to jump the fence, run across the track and leave this momentous celebration onto the field. And I don't know if my basketball coach was a mind reader at the time or what. But he came up to me and he said, Nick, when the game is over, stay off the field. And so I'm thinking to myself, well, yeah, you know, coach told me to stay in the stands, but I really want to, you know, I really want to experience this. I feel like I'm entitled. It's my senior year. I may never get this chance again. So sure enough, the last whistle blows. The score on the uh, scoreboard shows that our team won the game. I jump the fence. I run across the track. I'm running onto the field. And the problem was we actually had to run past the opposing team's bench to get onto the field and celebrate. And this was an away game for us, so this was the home team's bench we had to run past, and needless to say, they weren't too happy about the away fans running onto their field <laughs> to celebrate after their perfect season just got ruined. I literally, kids and I had to dodge like one or two players as I was trying to get onto the field that was trying to grab me and, and, and throw me off. But I made it to daylight, so I'm running to, to celebrate to the other side of the field where my friends are, and I look behind me, and I see my best friend at the time, Omar, and he's kind of looking like a cartoon character the way he's running. He's got his back arched, running like this in a zigzag motion. And he's got this football player, about six foot five, 250, just getting closer and closer and closer to him. And I had this split decision. I'm like, do I go back and save my friend, or do I continue on and celebrate and live out this vision that I had built up in my mind? Well, I'm a loyal guy. I didn't have much time to think about it, so I ran back to try and save Omar. Just as I'm getting to him, this football player is swinging him down to the turf by his t-shirt. And I come face to face with this guy, who now turns to me, and again, he's a head taller than me. He's still got his helmet on, his football pads. You can see the fire in his eyes. He's breathing blood and blood and sweat, and he's just angry, furious. And the only thing I could think to do, because I had a flashback to the video games I used to play when I was a little kid, where the bad guy at the end level always has like a weak spot where if you hit him there, that's how you defeat the, the bad guy at the, end, at the end level. So without thinking any further, I, I jumped in the air and tried to plant like this Bruce Lee kick right in the middle of his stomach because I thought maybe I can knock the wind out of him because he's got no padding there. That'll give me time to help Omar off the field and then we can go celebrate our victory like I had originally planned to. 
Well, unfortunately for me, the grass was wet that day. <laughs> so I ended up flat on my back, and as I'm sitting my head up to help my, get myself up off the ground, as if my head were just perfectly placed on a kicking tee, the player decides to plant that nice, swift cleat right in my face. Yes, oh. And I ended up in the emergency room. 24 stitches, plastic surgery, my mom's crying, and what started out as this glorious moment in my mind turned literally into this horrific nightmare in the emergency room. And, you know, the reason I'm telling you guys this story is because a lot of people will ask me, what's it like being an entrepreneur? What's it like being a business owner? What's it like taking a risk and starting a business? And the truth is, being an entrepreneur is a lot like what happened to me that night. Because your parents or your teachers or your friends may tell you to follow what's safest or what they believe is the safest path for you to follow. But you've got this vision in your mind of something that you want to turn into a reality, and you have the guts to go ahead and try and make that vision into a reality, despite the fact that there are some significant risks or odds against you that could prevent that from actually happening. So four out of five businesses fail in the first five years. That's statistically what happens. And in the next five years, the one out of five that made it through the first five, four out of those five will fail in the next five. So then the question becomes, why would anybody, if the failure rate is that high, even start a business? If, if the failure rate is that high, if the success rate is that low, why would anybody take the risk of being an entrepreneur and try to turn their vision into reality? And the truth is, because the entrepreneurs believe that they're not going to be one of the four out of five that fail. They have a vision that they're going to succeed. Now, just like I had a vision when I was sitting up in the stands that I was going to run over the field and celebrate, I knew in the back of my mind something could go wrong. I didn't think for, uh, for an instant that I was going to be in the emergency room, but I knew something could go wrong. But I took that risk anyway because I wanted to experience that vision that had built up into my head. So I tell you guys that story just to kind of set the tone for, for what it is to be an entrepreneur. And I'm going to share some more examples and analogies with you guys today of things that I've learned to hopefully prevent you from getting kicked in the head, metaphorically, when you guys launch your business. <laughs> really to help prevent you from getting blindsided. So what I thought was going to be this momentous celebration turned into a bloody nightmare. And ultimately what, again, I want to help you do is avoid getting blindsided. I got to tell you guys, I'm going to talk to you guys a lot today about some of the values and purpose-driven missions that we have with our own organization. Because you might, you guys might look at our company and say, well, College Hunks Hauling Junk is a moving company, it's a junk hauling company. What, what social mission or purpose could they have aside from going and picking up junk and taking it to be disposed of or going and moving somebody's furniture? Uh, but I want to talk to you guys a lot about what we've done in our organization that's really helped separate us from, from all the other businesses in our crowded industry and, and hopefully will help give you guys some inspiration to do that as well. We've all heard the cliche, money doesn't grow on trees, right? Yeah. So I'm here to tell you that obviously if money doesn't, you can't plant a tree in the ground and, and physically sprout up and, and drop leaves. But your business that you're creating to a, to a degree is essentially a money tree. Because what you're doing is you've taken your idea that you have in your head, which is essentially a seed that you could buy from, a, from a, a store or whatever. You're planting it in the ground and you're giving it the right environment, the right uh, inputs that it needs to grow and to be successful and eventually, eventually bear fruit, which is the money that will give you a successful and, and economics, economically fulfilling lifestyle that you're looking for. So the seeds that have to be, be, be planted in the ground to bear fruit is really what we're going to start and talk about today. And to me, you know, I know you guys all wrote business plans. You all, uh, you know, presented to your uh, investors and, and, and judges today. To me, I think what's important when you're starting off on the path of entrepreneurship is to have, number one, the history of your business mapped out. How did it get started? How did the idea create how was it created? And then number two, where are you going? So where have you been and where are you going? What's your history? What's your vision? What are the values that your company is going to stand for? What's the culture that you're going to create within it? 
the service you're going to provide, and ultimately the purpose that your company fulfills. So, the history of our company. Who here feels like they need a job right now? Anybody show of hands? I know we got some people. Any seniors here getting ready to graduate? Well, the summer before my senior year of college, all I was thinking about is I need a job when I graduate. I need a job next year after I graduate. So I was playing the resume game. I was brought up to study hard, get good grades, build up my resume, apply for a job, get into a good school, or I should say, get good grades, get a good corporate job, and then get into a good grad school and continue to climb the corporate ladder. But I had this problem that I realized very quickly my senior year of college, going into my senior year of college, I went from thinking that I need a job <laughs> to truly believing that work sucks. Because they wouldn't call it work if it was fun. They would call it, you're going to fun, you're not going to work, or you're going to play, you're not going to work. But in my mind, I was thinking to myself, well, work doesn't have to suck. Why, why is it that you know, people have to spend 10, 20, 30 years doing something that they don't enjoy or something that they're unfulfilled with or, or not passionate about, whether they're working for themselves or working for somebody else? There's got to be a different way. You know, I don't want to spend the next 20, 30, 40 years of my life doing something I don't like to do. So the summer before my senior year, unfortunately, I spent doing something I don't like to do. I was working in an office. It was a six by six cubicle, and it was at the International Monetary Fund in Washington, D.C. It was an internship. Great internship. It was going to look awesome on my resume. It was going to help me get a great job after I graduated. It was an unpaid internship on top of that, which, as a quick side note, I think is maybe the only form of legalized slavery that exists today. <laughs> I just can't imagine, can you imagine working 40, 50 hours a week, making copies, getting coffee, putting stuff in files, not getting paid for it, only for the hope that you can put something on your resume that will help you ultimately get paid in the future. Well, that's what I was doing. I was unfulfilled, obviously, as I told you. I didn't enjoy the experience of it. Meanwhile, that very summer, my buddy Omar, who I told you guys about earlier on the football field, he was driving around town in Washington, D.C. in an old beat-up cargo van that he borrowed from his mom. She had a furniture store. And he's going around town, he's putting flyers in people's mailboxes that say, college hunks hauling junk. Garage <laughs> clean out, basement clean out, miscellaneous moving. So Omar would come back at the end of the day and he'd be telling me these stories about how much money he was making. Again, you know, two, three hundred dollars, but for a college student, that's a ton of money. And you know, how much fun he was having, how much cool stuff he was finding. And I was coming back at the end of the day and saying, well, I spent 10, 12 hours, I was making copies, I was getting somebody coffee, I was filing papers, and I didn't make any money. And so that's when the light bulb went off for me. It was like, wow, there's a way to create an income for yourself without having to, you know, kind of fight up this corporate ladder that had always been laid out for me. And I would help him out in the evenings, I'd help him out on the weekends, uh, and, and I would actually, you know, Omar would pay me to help him out on the weekends and in the evenings. So to me, that was, was really exciting. We went back to school our senior year of college, and Omar wrote a business plan and entered it into an entrepreneurship competition. Sound familiar, guys? And uh, I remember he called me that senior year, and he said, Nick, I'm writing a business plan for college hunks hauling junk. I'm entering into an entrepreneurship competition. First prize is $10,000. Second prize and third place and fourth place is $500. I think I could at least get you know, top five finishers because we have some market research. I did this last summer. I've got some real numbers and statistics I can show that this business model would actually work. I said, yeah, it's a great idea. You know, I helped him write the business plan a little bit. He submitted it to the competition. And sure enough, he got first prize out of 150 entries. So when we tell people that story, they're like, wow. So that was the turning point for you guys. That's when you decided to take that $10,000 and you must have bought your first truck and you graduated from college and you started a business, didn't you? And unfortunately, you know, it wasn't that long ago, again, that I was sitting in your guys' seats. When, when you're in college, a lot of the times you're not thinking about next year. You're thinking about next weekend. <laughs> and you gotta remember, Omar was a second semester senior at the University of Miami in South Beach and just got handed $10,000 that he didn't have previously. So I'm sorry to say, the $10,000 did not make it to graduation, <laughs> unfortunately. But to be honest with you, and to be perfectly candid, it wasn't because we were careless or irresponsible. It's just we still didn't get it through our thick skulls that starting a business was a realistic opportunity or an option for us. We took the business plan, 
And we put it on our resume right at the top, business plan competition winners, first prize, and boom, we were at the top of every resume pile of every job that we were applying for. It definitely helped to set us apart, I'm not going to lie. We got great corporate jobs after we graduated from college back in Washington, D.C. We were working at consulting companies. And sure enough, our parents were proud, they were excited, but once again, we had that feeling of, I don't like getting up in the morning and doing what I'm doing. I don't like making these Excel reports for some big multi-billion dollar organization that is you know, helping them to shave a couple million dollars off their balance sheet. I'm not quite sure what tangible result or value I'm providing to society or to the world. So we're having that, that sort of feeling in the pit of our stomach once again that you know, this is not fun, there's gotta be something else. So I emailed Omar about six months into our corporate jobs and I said, what's our timeline for quitting our jobs and starting College Hunks Hauling Junk on a full scale? And he emailed me back, all capital letters, my timeline's right now, exclamation point, exclamation point, you know, let's do this. So that was the turning point for us. But you gotta imagine us coming to our parents now, who had just struggled to pay our way through a four-year college degree. We had just landed these awesome entry-level positions, making decent salaries out of college, and we're telling them that we're literally throwing it all away to start a business that didn't exist called College Hunks Hauling Junk, where we were going to drive around town picking up people's trash and moving around people's furniture for them. Well, we did it anyway. You know, they, they gave us ultimately some begrudging moral support. And that very first summer was pretty rough. We went from printing out Excel sheets to literally hauling trash. I mean, we were driving the trucks, picking up junk, answering the cell phone, writing stuff on the notepad. Sometimes we were doing it all at the same time. We would have the 800 number routed to our cell phone. And we'd be driving down the freeway, freeway from time to time talking to a customer trying to scribble something in a notepad. So naturally, if you're trying to do all that at once, you're going to swerve a little bit. The people driving behind us would call the 800 number to complain about the erratic driving. <laughs> <laughs> we'd be the ones in the driver's seat picking up the phone and saying, yes, we apologize. We don't condone that type of driving in our organization. <laughs> <laughs> we will let the driver know that they need to be more careful when they're on the road. Thank you for your call. But you know, when you start out your business, you're doing whatever the heck you can do to get that thing off the ground. And so if it's a matter of answering the phones, flipping the burgers, driving the truck, hauling the trash, coding the, the, you know, the technology for the website, whatever it takes, we were doing that. Because we knew we had to get the business to a profitability level, but we also quickly knew that if we wanted to grow to more than just a couple guys driving around in a truck, if we wanted to get it to become a legitimate business and not just be employed by ourselves, we had to start working on the business, not in the business. We had to start creating systems that would allow our business to scale to the next level. So the lesson there that you gotta kinda keep in mind as you guys look to take on entrepreneurial endeavors, whether it's a service business like mine, whether it's a product-based business, whether it's a technology business or an internet-based business, you want to figure out how is it that you can add value to your organization as quickly as possible by working on the business and not in the business. The sandwich maker makes the classic mistake of starting a sandwich shop and spend all his time making sandwiches instead of teaching somebody else how to make sandwiches as well as he does and then going out and opening up more shops or hiring more people or getting more catering gigs, whatever it may, may take. So that's the history of our company. The next thing that's most important for a successful entrepreneurial venture to have is a vision. Like the best entrepreneurs that I've seen speak, the founders of Facebook, the founders of Google, the founders of Zappos, they all have a vision for that future. You know, I mentioned to you uh, when I was sitting up in the stands, I had a vision of what running out in the field was going to feel like. I could literally feel the excitement of what it was going to be experienced when I ran out onto the field. Now, it didn't come to fruition, but I was able to envision it in my mind. So the best entrepreneurs are able to literally close their eyes, lean forward, and feel what the business is going to look like, feel like, act like, taste like, three years from the present day. And they're able to communicate that vision to their employees, to their investors, to their customers, or prospective customers, in a way that inspires those people to want to be a part of it. So the vision is much more important to me than the business plan. So this is where we get to kind of the heroic cause of college hunks hauling junk, because like I said, you might be looking at me and saying, well, he's got a bright, shiny one shirt, he's got a funny name on his business, 
Well, where's the social mission behind that? So to us, our vision is to become the largest employer of college students and youth in the nation and really an entrepreneurial launch pad. Bringing back the American dream to college students and their parents. Because we tell each one of our employees and staff members that when they come to work for us, they're not coming to become truck drivers and junk haulers and movers. They're coming to become, learn how to become business owners. We tell them, you work at other companies, they'll teach you how to play the game. We're going to teach you how to own the team. And that's our social mission. That's our higher heroic cause is to create an environment where our employees are empowered to treat the truck that they drive out every day as if it's their own small business. So they understand the money that's coming in, the money that's going out, they understand the impact they have on the lifetime value of the customer when they're providing service, they understand the marketing expenses that happen in the business, we provide open books so the employees understand how much they're impacting the bottom line of the company. So for us, we look at our business as a school where our franchise owners and our employees can empower themselves to learn and grow, whether they're going to start their own business, whether they're going to go on to work for us and move up within our organization, or whether they're going to go on to work for somebody else and be a much more valuable member of the team and of society. So starting with a vision, creating a strategic plan, and living by it. Let me go back uh, real quick. Values. So we talked about history, where we've been, vision, where we're going, and this is really the that, I think, where the most important piece of defining your business is going to lay. It's the core values of your business. A lot of companies out there have nice sounding core values. You see them up on a marble, uh, you know, uh, framed, engraved thing, sign, whatever you want to call it, inside the lobby. Uh, you see it on their website, you see it on their marketing material, but you're not really sure what it all means. Who here has heard of the company Enron? Yeah. Hey, you guys. Enron had four values, integrity, communication, respect, and excellence. And it was chiseled on a marble in the main lobby, had absolutely nothing to do with how that business was actually run. That company literally stole the pensions and retirement funds from every single employee that worked for them. So the real true core values, as opposed to ones that sound good, are the ones that are used as a metric to determine whether you're going to hire somebody, whether you're going to not hire somebody, whether you're going to fire somebody, whether you're going to not fire somebody. And let me tell you how you define the four, or not four, how you define, we have four, four, four core values. Let me tell you, tell you how you're going to define the core values in your business. Imagine that you've got three employees in your company and you're going to send them up to Mars. And in Mars, there's Martians, and they're going to observe your three employees as to how they conduct themselves, how they act, how they represent themselves, how they represent the company. The Martians don't speak English, they're just going to observe the attitude, the personality, and the way these employees of yours carry themselves. So if you can envision that scenario, I know it's a little bit out there, a little sci-fi for you guys, but if you can envision that scenario, what are the characteristics of the three best employees that you would send up there? What are the characteristics? How would you want your company to be best represented if they were being represented to a complete set of strangers in a complete foreign land? You know, you may not have employees right now, so you can't pick a real person that works for you, but if you were to pick a hypothetical employee to send up to Mars to represent your brand or your organization, what characteristics would that person embody and live on a day-to-day -day basis that you would want to be able to send up there to best represent your organization. So we did this exercise with our management team. We came up with four core values that really feed into our overall social mission. Building leaders, which I already talked about with you guys. Always branding, as you can see, I'm always branding. I asked my fiance, or somebody asked me, you know, what does is, what is always branding mean? I asked my fiance, how do I explain what always branding means? She said, just tell them it means you wear the same thing to work every day. So, okay, that's what it means. Uh, create a fun, enthusiastic team environment because if the team members aren't having fun at work, if they think work sucks, then how in the world are they going to be able to deliver an amazing service to the customers? And then last but not least, listen, fulfill, delight our, our clients, our franchise owners, and our team members. 
to provide a wow experience. Those are our four core values. That doesn't mean they should be your four core values. In order to define your company's core values, again, do that Mission to Mars exercise. It will take you 15 minutes of kind of thinking and reflecting with your team or your part business partners, and you'll be able to come up with them very easily. Uh, just like an example, again, of why you have to live the core values, not just talk about them or put them up on the wall. Building leaders, as I mentioned, is one of our core values. This guy in between, uh, me on the right with the orange shirt, that's Omar on the left, uh, that's Chris Jackson. He started out as a wingman at our Raleigh franchise location. The wingman is the lowest man on the total pole in our company. He's the guy that doesn't say anything to the customer. He's the guy that doesn't have any responsibility. His only responsibility in the company is to lift the other end of the couch to help put it up in the truck while the captain's kind of directing the flow of things. So Chris Jackson, this was three and a half years ago, started out as a ring man of the company. He's now the director of marketing for our entire organization. We've got 40 franchises across the country, $10 million in system-wide revenues, uh, you know, 300, 400 employees nationwide. And so this guy moved from wingman to captain to manager to uh, social media manager uh, to the franchise coach to now direct our entire marketing department. And so that's what I talk about as far as building leaders and, and living the core values. And it's important to be talked about and celebrated and rewarded and recognized and tell stories about it as much as you possibly can. We're always branding. One thing that we really try and talk about with our company is how do we create a brand lover? You know, how do we create something within our organization where people are going to literally tattoo our logo on their arm or wait in line for you know 20 minutes to pay four dollars for a freaking cup of coffee <laughs> or name your dog Jetta like my fiance did because she was obsessed with the Volkswagen Jetta. I mean that's a brand lover. So you know we do things to try and live our brand to deliver a wow experience to our customers. We emulate other organizations that are renowned for their customer service. We look at companies like the Ritz Carlton that gives each one of their frontline staff a budget of $1,000 a month to spend on making the customer's experience better if the customer's having a bad experience while staying at the hotel. Literally, from the valet guy to the housekeeper to uh, the person serving drinks, if a customer is upset or, or having a negative experience at the Ritz Carlton, those employees are empowered to spend up to $1,000 per month on wowing a customer and making that customer experience something that's pretty, pretty memorable. Southwest Airlines. I got on a Southwest Airlines plane one time. I opened the, uh, what do you call it, the uh, overhead compartment. And there was a flight attendant in there, jumped out of it, it was like, ah, scary. Southwest Airlines core values is having fun. They're all about creating a company culture of fun and excitement. They get on there, I don't know if anybody, has anybody here uh, flown Southwest Airlines? A few of you guys, of course. They would get on the uh, microphone and rap the how to put on a seatbelt and, and you know where the oxygen masks are and all that kind of stuff. So they're living their core values. So we look at the best of the best companies as far as living their core values and trying to emulate those to uh, to live them on a daily basis in our business. And one other thing which we took from a page of who here has heard of Zappos? Zappos.com is a website where you can buy shoes and now other clothing. Uh, and, and accessories and other items of, of that nature. They were started three years ago by a guy named Tony Shea and recently sold to Amazon.com for a billion dollars. And they literally built their business on customer service and company culture. Uh, if you call Zappos Call Center, they will spend as much time as they need to help you have a better shopping experience. And their CEO and founder will tell the story about how he, how he actually uh, put it to the test. He had somebody call their call center to order a pizza, even though they obviously don't sell pizza, they sell shoes. And the call center rep actually Googled the nearest pizza delivery place to the person who was calling, called them on the other phone, ordered a pizza for them, and uh, you know, provided that, that service to them. That's going above and beyond. So something they do at Zappos, which we did this year at our company, is we sent a survey out to everybody in our organization that says, how do you define the college hunks falling junk culture? And we compile all answers from all the franchise owners, employees, call center reps, haulers, movers, and we publish it in a book, which we do on an annual basis now, so that everybody within the organization is a contributor as part of the company culture. 
Now, this is where I want to talk about some of the things that I think you guys are working towards in terms of creating a value-based or a social enterprise that truly adds value to the world. You know, what is it that makes these brands loved so passionately? You know, what is it that makes somebody get a Harley Davidson tattoo or go out of their way to, to fly Southwest Airlines, making it the most profitable airlines, or I should say, the only profitable airlines in the past <laughs> 20 years? Uh, you know, people that drink Guinness, they won't drink any other beer. People that buy, that love Apple, oh, I don't know, why was that happening? But let me stop moving around. I'll stand right here. So, you know, what, what creates a brand lover? And I'm going to tell you what creates a brand lover, and it's exactly what you guys are doing. A purpose-driven company creates a brand lover. A revenue-based company, a company that's all about creating money trees as opposed to something that adds value, uh, they'll create customers, but they're not going to create brand lovers. The, the businesses that have a social or true purpose to add value are the ones that are going to ultimately uh, have longevity and have profitability and have tr true loyalty, which is the way of the future in business. So building relationships, creating an experience. Talk to your fans, connect with your brand lovers, spend money on client experience, deliver on your brand promise. And here's what's most important. If you're gonna create brand lovers, you have to have 100% commitment from your team. From the front lines to the back lines. Everybody that's on the bus that you're driving to that vision that you've created at the very beginning has to buy in to the purpose that you believe in. And if they don't, you gotta get them out of the company as quickly as possible because that is no, nothing different than a cancer that can just spread and, and create negativity and prevent your company from growing and fulfilling its mission. So there's two human emotions when somebody makes a purchase. They're either going to purchase based on fear or they're going to purchase based on love. I'll give you an example. If somebody calls an exterminator, they're making that purchase based on fear because there's rats or roaches or something in their house that they need to get rid of. If somebody waits in line to buy a $4 cup of coffee, they're buying that based on love because they love the experience of walking into that Starbucks and enjoying themselves. And not to get too high tech with you, but my business partner reads a lot of sci-fi, or not sci-fi, a lot of science books. And in terms of wavelengths, the love wavelength is a much narrower, short wavelength, high frequency wavelength. And as human beings, we all have an ability to connect and share and, and spread uh, news and, and information uh, to each other. So if there's a brand that somebody loves, the impact of that is much, much, much more effective than if there's a brand that somebody is just you know, using out of fear. So that's something to keep in mind, and ultimately what you're going to create is brand angels. So we took all of that into account, our core values, our culture, our service philosophy, and we made our overall social mission as an organization to move the world. And what that means is obviously we're a moving company. It's got a double meaning. We like to move stuff. But if we can move people emotionally by removing the stress that they're feeling when they're moving and create brand lovers out of them, that's what allows a company as bare bones as ours in, a, in an industry that's riddled with competition to be able to grow uh, in, in a down economy and a recession to the level that we have. So I'm going to now kind of start to, to wrap things up with a few kind of stories and anecdotes for you guys that I think will be kind of uh, interesting. And I don't know why that keeps happening, but hopefully it won't shut off completely. Uh, who here had a lemonade stand as a little kid? A few of you guys. Taryn, how, how much did you charge for lemonade when you had your lemonade stand? Well, we charged them anything how much they wanted to. Oh, you charged them anything you wanted to. Now that's an enterprising concept. <laughs> what they thought it was worth. I like that. Um, well, we charged, when I was six years old, my sister and I, we went and had a lemonade stand. I wanted to charge 25, I wanted to charge a dollar. My sister, she wanted to charge 25 cents. Well, I said to myself, I'm going to do this lemonade stand with my sister, and we're splitting 25 cents. There's not a lot of profit that I can make with that 25 cents or 12 and a half cents that I have to split with her. And we didn't obviously take into account the fact that we had some, you know, no costs with our lemonade. We took it out of our parents' refrigerator. <laughs> but... Uh, I wanted to charge a dollar. My sister always got her way. She set up the lemonade stand and said, lemonade, 25 cents. I went and got my bike and put it right next to hers, and I put a sign out that said, lemonade, one dollar. So you can imagine the perplexed looks on people's faces, especially our neighbors, as they were driving by and stopped and saw these two little kids with essentially competing lemonade stands. Here's this cute little girl charging 25 cents, and here's this brash young boy charging a dollar for lemonade. 
Well, I want to ask you guys a question. Who do you guys think, that first time around, that first time they ever saw the lemonade stand, who do you guys think they bought more lemonade from? Actually, they bought more lemonade from me that very first time around. And I'm going to tell you why. People's buying decisions are based on emotion. People, the first time people buy anything, it's based strictly on emotion. They justify it, they rationalize it, they back it up with logic. The second, third, and fourth time they'll buy something, it's based on the experience or the logic they had after having something for the first time. So somehow, some way, the neighbors got some sort of emotional satisfaction by indulging this little kid that had the nerve to charge a dollar for lemonade when his sister was clearly charging 25 cents for the exact same lemonade. And uh, the, the, the funny thing about it is I wasn't providing any more sugar or fresh squeezed or larger cups or anything like that. It was the exact same lemonade. So the next weekend, we set up the exact same competing lemonade stands. And then who do you guys think they bought more lemonade from? Then they bought more lemonade from my sister. Because people buy the first time around based on emotion. The second, third, fourth time, they'll buy based on the experience they had the first time. And we ran into this problem with our company. When we first started, we thought the brand was all we needed. Flashy logo, catchy name, bright colors, put a sign up on the street corner, park our truck in a parking lot, and the phone was going to ring. And sure enough, it did. It you know, stood out in a crowded, in a crowded you know, marketplace. But what happened was, when we would go haul junk for people or move their furniture, they quickly realized that even though we were charging two or three times more than our competition, that maybe just had a pickup truck or a U-Haul van or whatever, we really weren't providing any customer experience or service that was any different from what they could have gotten for the cheaper alternative. So that's when we realized that we had to not only have a catchy brand, but ultimately a memorable experience that would allow our business to grow through word of mouth, loyalty, repeat business, and everything else. So image might get you through the door, it might get people to come through the door, but it's the experience that's ultimately going to help make price irrelevant. I talked about Starbucks a little bit, and I'll, I'll be kind of quick with this example. Who knows the difference, or what's the difference between a 7-Eleven cup of coffee and a Starbucks cup of coffee? The price. The price, $2, maybe $3. You know, I've heard they call Starbucks 4 bucks or 5 bucks. Now, this might be debatable, but some would argue that in a taste test, 7-Eleven coffee tastes better than Starbucks cup of coffee. So why would anybody would not only wait in line, but pay three, four, five times more for a Starbucks cup of coffee than a 7-Eleven cup of coffee? The experience. The experience, absolutely right. When you walk into a Starbucks, it's warm, it smells good, you've got Wi-Fi, you can sit down with your friends, you can read the paper, you can go up to the counter from the barista, and order a tall mocha chocolate tino with the whipped cream and the drizzle of you know, caramel on top, right? When you walk into a 7-Eleven, it's a different kind of experience. Who knows what the smells are gonna be? It might be a combination of Lysol and hot dogs. <laughs> and you wanna get the heck out of there as fast as you came in. So it's really all about the experience. It's allowing, it's able to make any sort of brand in any sort of industry allow the price to become irrelevant and allows the experience to create loyalty in the community. I put a picture of the steak up there, not just because I like steak and it's delicious, but you have to have sizzle, which is the brand, and steak, which is the experience. And those are the two components that are ultimately gonna create loyalty for your organization. Who here knows, this is a nice little quiz, who here knows what the, uh, these brands up here all have in common? Who said franchise first? Raise your hand, you get a book. Well, you actually may already have one, but you can give this as a present to somebody who's graduating. Let me run up here. Give her a round of applause. Keep it around. Here What's your name? Elise. Elise, good job. So all these are franchises. So how do we grow our business from one location to multiple locations without a lot of money, without a lot of staff, without a lot of time because we wanted to be a national brand quickly? We did it through franchising. And basically all franchising is, if I get back to that uh, money tree analogy, let's say you guys want to plant a tree in your front yard. You can go to the, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it, garden store, buy a packet of seeds. You can put the seed in your front yard, you, can, you know, or actually not in your front yard, you got to put it in a little dish first with uh, some artificial light and some, you know, coverage and water it and put fertilizer and all that kind of stuff and get it to a little sapling 
get a little bigger, and ultimately go put it in your front yard and hopefully grow it to a full-fledged tree. Or you can go down to the garden store and buy a tree that's already this tall. They already went through the process of getting it from point A to point B. All you got to do is go put it in your yard and get it to point C. Well, that's essentially what buying a franchise is, is buying a business that's already created all the infrastructure is already in place, the branding, the marketing, the operations, the systems, so you don't have to create all that from scratch. You're buying a business that's already halfway through the relay race, and you just need to get it to the finish line and make it profitable. So what we did with our business is we created all the systems. We created the marketing, we created the uh, sales, the hiring, the management, the uh, IT, the uh, website, and everything else, so that business owners, they wanted to own their own business, but didn't want to go through the trial and error of starting something from scratch, uh, could do so by owning a franchise of college and installing junk. There's obviously thousands of franchise opportunities out there, so it's an opportunity that somebody can take if they want to be a business owner and not start from scratch, or if somebody has a concept that they want to grow into other markets, but they don't have a lot of money to invest in those other markets, it's to, a, it's to some extent a uh, financing tool to expand your brand. So I put the picture of the multiple money trees up there. So you guys can kind of see where I'm going with that. And the only way we were able to do that is creating systems in our organization for people to follow. Because if we didn't have those systems for people to follow a playbook for somebody to execute, there would be no value, there would be no reason for somebody to buy our franchise as opposed to just starting with something on their own. I went to a, uh, I went to a uh, entrepreneurship conference not too long ago, and it was the founder of Boston Market. Anybody even at a Boston Market? Uh, it was actually, they, at, when, they, when they IPO'd, it was the largest IPO in history. Obviously, that stock's not done so well lately, but he left the company since then, and uh, he was also one of the original uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken franchise owners. And he said, classic entrepreneurial mistake is trying to do too many businesses all at the same time. He pretty much said, you can't ride more than one bicycle at the same time. He didn't put it so eloquently. He said, you can't sit on more than one toilet at the same time. But I thought with this audience, it'd be more appropriate to have pictures of the bicycles than somebody trying to sit on two toilets. <laughs> so the truth is, most entrepreneurs have some sort of built-in attention deficit disorder. Whether we've been diagnosed with it or not, we want to chase the next shiny thing. Something over here sounds like a good idea. Let's try that. Some over here sounds like a great idea. Let's try that. Oh, this one sounds cool. We can make some money there. Let's do that. And meanwhile, what you end up with is just like this picture, a whole pile of nothing. And we have been no different than falling victim to that. We tried to launch a business called College Foxes Packing Boxes. <laughs> we thought, hey, that sounds pretty good. That'd be a cool uh, sister company to our main business. We actually went, who's seen the show Shark Tank on ABC? We were on the very first episode uh, of that show, the first time it ever aired three years ago pitching that very concept to the investors. And, uh, you know, we actually spent money, we built the website, we built some logo, we built some branding, we thought, you know, this would be a great complement to our core business. Well, the business didn't work, and not only that, it was a huge distraction from college hunts hauling junk, and ultimately, it was a big waste of time, although it was maybe had some publicity benefit because we went on the TV show. But the point I'm trying to make is, if you're gonna pursue your vision, if you're gonna pursue your business idea, you need to be laser sharp focused and pursuing it. Obviously, you're gonna make little twists and turns and your business plan is gonna evolve and change over time, but you can't be so uh, ADD where you're chasing every shiny thing that pops up or curveball that pops out at you. All right, um, I'm, I'm winding down here because I wanna make sure I leave some time for questions, but uh, a question that gets posed to me a lot when I talk to the media is, do you think entrepreneurs are born or do you think entrepreneurship can be taught? And I think, uh, you guys would not be here, your professionals would not be here, I would not be here today if we did not truly believe that entrepreneurs can be taught, entrepreneurs can be developed and created. That being said, there are certain innate qualities that I believe entrepreneurs have that allow them to take the lead, to take the risk, to persevere when there's setbacks, to learn from their failures, to get off the couch and stop watching TV and drinking beer and go do something about the business idea or the vision that they have. Just like the best athletes in the world, you know, LeBron James, uh, Tiger Woods when he was in his prime, uh, you know, who do we have here in Dallas? Tony Romo, <laughs> Dirk. They were born with certain uh, 
you know, God-given talents, right? But they still spend more time than anybody else on their team fine-tuning their skills, working on their jump shot, working on their throwing, working on their speed and strength. So the same thing holds true with the most successful entrepreneurs. They're born with certain gifts that allow them to see the future, inspire others, take a risk, take a leap of faith, but they also work on their craft. They work on their skills to allow them to be successful, to prevent themselves from failing. So to me, I think the five areas to focus on and, and work to improve yourself at, especially while you're young, is leadership first and foremost. And when I say leadership, I don't mean by dictating to people what needs to be done. I mean by being able to effectively communicate your vision in a way that it, it inspires those around you to want to be a part of it. It inspires your investors to invest. It inspires your customers to buy. It inspires your employees to work for you. That's what leadership is truly about. I got a picture of the snake oil guy because sales is extremely important if you're going to be an entrepreneur. You don't want to be like the negative uh, stigma of sales that the snake oil guy carries. You don't want to be the, the, the shifty uh, car salesman. What you really want to do from a sales standpoint is be able to help people. That's all sales is. It's all about helping. Because if you're selling, you're doing something to someone. But if you're helping, you're doing something for someone. And your product or service helps somebody, why should you feel negative about, uh, about um, you know, helping somebody? Why should you feel shy or nervous about telling somebody about how your product can help them? You should be excited to tell the world about it and not get discouraged if they don't see how it helps them right out of the gates. Customer service, I've already talked about at the beginning. I got a picture of the football player sucking the oxygen tank. And the reason that is, is because cash to a business is like oxygen to a human being. If you are not able to manage the cash coming in and the cash going out, you're going to feel like you're suffocating. And your business is going to suffocate and ultimately it's going to die. So you got to be able to manage the money coming in or going out of your business. And I put the picture of the logistics uh, image there because really being able to make decisions on the fly. When I ran out on the football field, saw Omar getting chased, saw my buddies over there celebrating, I had to make a split decision. Might not have been the right decision, but, you know, heck, what are you going to do? you got to live with your decisions. Who here likes to read? It's okay if you don't. You don't have to raise your hand. I will make a confession to you. Your professors may not like this, but I honestly didn't read, I don't think, more than five books until after I graduated from college. And it wasn't because I didn't like to read, it was because I didn't find anything that I was passionate about or interested in that motivated me to want to pick up a book and read. Now I read books all the time. That's, to me, the best return on investment you can make with your money is buying a book. There's books that I've read that have made literally our company millions of dollars. A $10 book has made us millions of dollars. And so I put up here four books that we didn't read when we were in college that I think had I read them when I was in your seats, it would have placed me on a much faster track to getting our business up and going and to believing in the, the power of being an entrepreneur. So the first one, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, is getting out of the mindset of the shoebox that society places on people that you have to study hard, you have to get good grades, you have to get a good job. It, it, it talks about creating assets and income producing businesses and investments that allow you to become financially free. Number two, E-Myth Revisited is all about working on your business, not in your business. Creating systems that allow you to scale and grow your company. Has anybody here ever seen a purple cow? I just want to make sure. I, I asked that question uh, once and, and this girl jumped up and raised her hand. I said, well, what were you smoking when you saw that thing? <laughs> but the purple cow I said, Godin, is imagine driving down a you know, country road and you see a big field of brown cows. In that field is one purple cow. Obviously, you're going to stop your car and you're going to notice that thing because it stands out. So it's a short marketing book. It's all about how do you create something that's remarkable from a brand standpoint, but also from an experience standpoint that will allow your business to grow. And, you know, Effortless Entrepreneur by myself and my business partner, uh, we wrote this book two years ago with the idea that, man, if there was one book we wish we had read as young people to put us on the path of entrepreneurship, it, was this, it would be this book. I think most of you guys got a free copy when you came in. Uh, I'm happy to stick around when we're done to sign it for you. If you didn't get a free copy, uh, Jen will be selling some extra copies. We didn't bring a lot of them. 
But, uh, you know, again, the best way to, to uh, put yourself on the right path is to fill yourself with the right tools to be successful as a business owner. Um, quick story here. I know we're running a little low on time, but I'm almost done, I promise. Um, I played a prank on the last school that I came and talked to. I'm not going to do it to you guys because I like you guys. You guys are smart. <laughs> but uh, basically, I put a, uh, the picture up here of Jay-Z. And I asked everybody, I said, why do we have Jay-Z up here if we're talking about entrepreneurship? And everybody goes, well, he's an entrepreneur. He's an entrepreneur. I said, yeah, he is. You know, what's his, he has a line. It's, I'm not a businessman. I'm a business man. <laughs> but uh, so I told the audience, I said, well, good news. I reached out to Jay-Z's people. We got everything uh, under control. Everybody, if you can look to the back of the room, give it up for Jay-Z, everybody. And of course, everybody, <gasps> big gasp, turns their heads, and Jay-Z wasn't standing there. <laughs> and then they looked at back at me, which is fire in their eyes, because like I had you know, literally just broken their hearts. But the reason I told the story is because, who's heard this line? It's not what you know, it's who you know. Who you know. But the problem is, I know Jay-Z. But Jay Z doesn't know me. <laughs> so it's really not who you know, it's who knows you. So at the end of my speech, I'll put up all my contact information, but if you got a second, grab your cell phone real quick out your pockets. Send me a quick text, or if you got a smartphone, send me an email and just put your email in there. Uh, don't just say, hey, how you doing? Put your actual email address in there. I promise that I won't spam you, but what I will do is send you the 10 business commandments that we put in our book uh, because, you know, Obviously, if you read the Bible, you may not remember everything that you read, but you're going to remember the Ten Commandments as sort of a guiding structure to follow. So we put Ten Business Commandments in it, and we think if you follow those, at least it won't let you fall too far off course of your business. If you guys are into the social media, Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn, you can just go to my website, nickfriedman.com, and I've got all my links on there. Uh, and if you want to learn more about the book, effortlessentrepreneur.com. But I'll put that slide back up uh, if, uh, if you guys didn't get a chance to send me your email. So as I kind of start to wrap up, I want to talk about, you know, the idea. And you guys are obviously all here because you had a great idea. And you put together that idea and you developed it and you came to pitch it to this business competition. And some of you guys have, 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 are going to, you know, be recognized and win awards. Um, so I think you guys are much farther ahead than most, because a lot of times people will say, well, I don't have an idea, or, or you know, how do I come up with an idea? And I look at them and I say, look, surely they say nothing's been invented that hasn't already, and, or, or nothing can be invented that hasn't, hasn't been already, and you know, my business is kind of living proof of that. We took a simple concept, trucks and labor. We put a catchy brand to it, we put a focus on customer service, and that's allowed our business to grow. So really, it's not about the idea that matters. It's not about what's the idea. It's what you're going to ultimately do with the idea or the vision that you come up with. So my next slide is more for the professors, but it really doesn't apply here because I show this slide at other schools where I go to talk about entrepreneurship. And uh, um, you know, I think a lot of the schools I talk to are not quite as progressive as this school is in terms of the business plan and the competition and things of that nature. But I think it's important for schools that are teaching entrepreneurship to give students an opportunity to pitch their business, to experience rejection, to experience failure, to actually try and launch those businesses through uh, simulation pitches, through uh, Shark Tank style investment uh, pitches, to allow to experience negativity or, or failure without squelching the passion or dreams or vision that you guys have come up with. You know, I think one of the, the, uh, the most important things for professors to do is not be vision killers or creativity killers. Uh, you look at the, the example, most famous example, Fred Smith, the founder of FedEx, he got a C minus on his senior business paper. His professor told him it was the craziest idea he's ever heard of. And of course, we all know what FedEx is today as far as a, a, an organization and a company. And also, I think it's important for professors to recognize you can't force entrepreneurship onto students. I think it's important to expose students that may have an interest in entrepreneurship programs, but not everybody is going to be an entrepreneur. Not everybody is going to want to go down that path. Some people are absolutely going to want to work in other organizations, but I think it's important that we uh, instill the values of entrepreneurship that can be applied to working for somebody else if that's what they choose to do. Creativity, initiative, adding value to the organization that you're a part of, even if you're not the founder or owner of that, uh, 
of that organization. And also taking advantage of mentorship programs, networking when you're on campus uh, with alumni, with fellow entrepreneurs in your community. As students, you will never have less responsibility than you do right now, like right this second. Like now, you have more responsibility than you did two seconds ago. And it's only going to get more and more and more. When you graduate, you're going to have student loans to start paying off. You might get married, and then you got a family, or you might buy a house, and then you got a mortgage. All of a sudden, you got more and more responsibility the older you get. The younger you are, the less responsibility you have, the less you have to lose by taking a risk. You're already accustomed to eating ramen noodles. So, you know, once you get accustomed to eating five-star meals because you're accustomed to getting a paycheck, the idea of quitting your job and risking all that is going to be a lot, a lot less likely to happen than if you try and take a risk right now when you're young. So the, the, the I guess, message I'm going to leave with you guys right now is, you know, what's your bias for action? What are you going to do after today, after you leave here? What are you going to implement from the business plans you come up with? What steps are you going to take to put that vision into a reality? Whether it's something you learned from today from my long-winded speech, or something that you learned from the judges uh, with questions that they asked or ideas that they gave to you, you know, what action are you going to take? And I guess the, the first question, I, I, before, I, before I end with that message, you guys may have seen this one before, but you know, who wants this copy, the copy of this book? Who wants it? Anybody can have it. Anybody at all? Anybody whatsoever? Anybody? Anybody have it? Exactly. Exactly. Sorry, I think you probably have one in your bag, but no worries. Um, so obviously that's kind of a silly example, but what did he do? He got up out of his seat, he took action, he went and grabbed the book from out of my hands, and I said, who wants it? Everybody else was kind of like unsure, like, you know, what is he talking about? Who wants it? I guess I could want it, but I already have one in my bag, so we're going to do it in a second. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, the lesson there is to take action. Usually the person in the front row jumps up and grabs it. And so then my second lesson is that it's beneficial to sit in the front row. Uh, <laughs> that didn't work out to me. Uh, but take action. You know, it, it's, it's as simple as that. It doesn't necessarily mean launch your business tomorrow, but take some steps to put it in motion. Try it out. Take what you've learned today from your pitches. Talk to further investors in the community. Try and put it into motion and see where it goes. Ultimately, ideas mean nothing without action. You guys all have great ideas. They may not work. They might. They may not work the way you initially set them out to be. There may be some, some transition over time. It may not be your entire team that puts it into motion. You may go off and do it on your own. But ultimately, it's people that take an idea and put it into action that are the true difference makers. Because ideas are a lot like sneezes. They might get a rise out of a few people, infect a few people, but eventually they're going to fade away. It's the people that take an idea, whether it's for themselves, for their family, for their personal business, for their uh, company that they work for, and they put that idea into action and make it a reality that are the true difference makers. So your only to-do list or homework assignment that I have given you guys today when you leave here is to take action. Just make sure you don't get kicked in the head when you do it. And I think we probably now have like five minutes for questions because I talked too long. But let's open. It. I'll be out here for the book signing afterwards, so I can answer some more questions there. But uh, thank you guys very much for taking the time to listen to me. So I guess if anybody has any questions that they want to raise their hands, and I'm happy to answer. No questions. Yes? So how is it working with the friends? I've heard that it's been not to work with friends, that it's good to work with friends. What's your experience? Awesome question. She said, what is it like working with a friend as a business partner? Is it good? Is it not good? Um, without sounding uh, self-promotional, there is a chapter in the book that I just gave you about that. But uh, truthfully, the most important thing of working with any business partner, whether he's your friend, your girlfriend, your husband, whatever, is that the vision and the values, which we talked about today, they gotta be in alignment. They've got to be in alignment. If the vision and the values are divergent in any way, at any point in time of the partnership, the partnership's gonna crumble and it, and it makes it worse if you're a friend also, because then ultimately the friendship is gonna suffer or crumble as well. 
So for as many disagreements that Omar and I have on a daily basis, I mean, we've literally had fist fights over disagreements in our business. Uh, our vision of where we're going and the values of what we stand for have never been divergent. They've always been on par. Uh, and because of that, it's allowed us to enjoy the fact that we're also friends and celebrating the victories together and you know, wallowing in the, in the failures or setbacks together. It, sure, it, it, it has put some strain on our friendship, I'm not going to lie. We don't hang out as much as we used to from a social standpoint because we're talking about business whenever we do and we need to be able to unplug from it. Um, but I guess the best way I can kind of wrap up that final question is, you know, they say 50% of marriages end in divorce. I would say it's probably the same for business partnerships. And the reason that a marriage or business partnership is going to uh, fail a lot of times has to do with uh, lack of communication or lack of vision and values uh, in, in, in terms of alignment. And so I think it's just a matter of communicating. One thing that Omar and I do, and this should be done if you guys have any business partners or are thinking about going into business partnerships, is each year we write down our vision statement for the company, which is what the business is going to look like three years from now. And then we write that down separately and then come together and share the notes that we each wrote down for ourselves and we kind of talk about where did we differ, where are we the same, you know, where can we come together and create alignment. So that's something else that uh, I think is, is doable. I think there's another hand. Yes? Well, we do, uh, and we do actually have two franchises in Dallas. Both are kind of the Plano area, but service the greater metro area. Uh, we actually have one of our new franchise owners came here to, to, to watch uh, Daniel Dossi, um, and uh, actually our director of franchise development is also here. But we do have a franchise, so give us a shout. We'll move you no problem. <laughs> I did not pay her to say that. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. So the question is, you know, what's my advice for taking some sort of lean launch uh, or taking action on getting things going? Great question. I mean, you know, for us, we were fortunate because our business was obviously a non-technical business, didn't require a significant investment up front to get started. We needed a truck, a logo, a website, and some flyers to start generating enough revenue to pay for those, you know, overhead and ultimately reinvest to get another truck and you know, an office. And, and a better website and better software and so forth. So a lot of it's going to depend on the needs of, of the business that you're looking at. That being said, I think there's a lot of test marketing that you can do, a lot of test launches that you can do uh, on a smaller scale uh, that don't necessarily require a significant investment. Scale your, your grand business plan back a little bit to, you know, if I can't get investors or if I can't get money from the bank, could I actually make this produce income? Is there a way to do it? If there's not, you know, maybe you can't do it without outside capital, but there might be a way. You know, there might be a way to do things more cost effectively by looking at maybe outsourcing some of the development expenses or uh, bringing in interns to help you develop the, the programs, you know, college students to, to help do some of the, the coding of, of the website, you know, even if it's not perfect initially, but just to get the the bare bones created to ultimately give you maybe a better chance of getting investment down the road. I think, you know, to be honest, I haven't done a ton of, of early startup investments. I, I just invested into a, a, a fund called the Gen Y Capital Partners, uh, which is actually would be something good for, for those of you that are looking at launching because it invests in businesses and startups by, for people under the age of 30.